to the LGBTQ plus panel. Such an honour to be here and I'm so grateful that TikTok has given us this platform. I wish I had an outlet like, outlet like this when I was younger. Um, so we're here with our lovely guests today. Hello guys, how are you? Hi. Hi. We're good. We're good. And, um, for the people that have been living under a rock, could you one by one just say who you are, what you do, and all that jazz? <laughs> Hi, I'm Robin, otherwise known as Juicy Girl TV. Um, I am a TikTok and Instagram creator. I do a lot of makeup and cosplay content. And I'm known more so these days because I have a very big public coming out as a trans woman. So that ends up yeah. getting me on a big stage talking about LGBTQ plus <laughs> topics. <laughs> Hello, I'm Charlie. I'm also, I started out on TikTok. I do social media, but I'm also a musician. Um, up and coming, no music out yet. Uh, but yeah, I do like lifestyle, um, advocate stuff, funny stuff, fashion, makeup, whatever. Just whatever floats my boat on the day. But yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Scotty Waters, or also known as the TikTok Jesus. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I dress as Jesus on TikTok, I make historical content and outrage bigots. I love your content, by the way, I'm a massive fan. I watch all your stuff. So, I just said a minute ago how much I would have loved an outlet when I was younger, um, as a young queer person. And Robin, um, as a trans woman yourself, um, you must have had to go through a lot of confusing times and hard times. I just wanted to know, like, what was an outlet for you growing up that helped you express yourself? Um, well, specifically for me, there wasn't exactly too much of an outlet. I actually went the opposite route of suppression. Um, yeah. And it's a big part of why I make that content that I do today. When I was growing up, and especially when I first learned about being, being transgender, I discovered it and I understood that about myself about seven years ago. But it took me seven years yeah. to then come out. Because growing up in the time where I grew up, there wasn't as much accessibility to communities on the internet. Yeah. We're talking the MySpace days and DeviantArt. Yeah. And, um, and I learned what being transgender meant in the year of 2016. Right, so. A wonderful year to learn what being transgender meant. Um, <laughs> you know, this was a year where a lot of anti-trans and anti-queer yeah. propaganda was prevalent on the internet. You had all of your anti-SJW snowflake compilations and all the hits. And for me now, coming out and, and making content that I do, I ended up speaking to a lot of younger people who were the age that I was seven years ago. Oh, that's amazing. Who are able to feel more open and have that outlet now. Um, and it's become a bit of a responsibility that's... that's, that's You've kind of almost kind of way. become an outlet for other trans people. Yeah, and I, people I take a lot of pride in that. That you should do, honestly. No, that's a lovely story. Thank you so much for sharing. Obviously, being in the LGBTQ plus community, it comes with a lot of hurdles. I'm sure that we've all had to jump over stuff. And Charlie, I just want to know, like, since you're starting your content career, the content creator journey, um, what has been the biggest um, hurdle you, I would, you would say that like, you've jumped? Uh, I would say um, accepting that people have opinions, whether you like them or not. I mean, like, leaving school, school was hell, because obviously being bullied in school, like, that was my life. And when I left, it was like, oh. I can breathe. And then starting social media again was like school times a million. Um, so I think it, the biggest hurdle was accepting that like people have opinions, but not every opinion is important. The most important opinion is your own. So like, you know, if you train yourself mentally, um, you know, to be healthy to yourself and you know, you focus on what's, what matters to you and like the people that matter to you, creating a support system around you, like, Nothing else really matters. An opinion is an opinion. Um, so yeah, but um, it, it did take. It took some time. I mean, the first like year or two was not really nice. I had death threats. Um, had to report stuff to the police. It was really scary. But um, yeah, I think three, three, four years on, like you grow a thick skin, and yeah. So, just, yeah especially in school, I'm sure that we all went through a lot in school as a part of the LGBT. Um, like, what was school like for you guys? I know you said back when you were coming to terms with things, you know, back in 2016. I'm not sure what time you were at school, but I'm sure it wasn't as what it is now, especially in the generation of becoming more woke to things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in university at the time, oh, really? so I was I was secretly experimenting in my dorm room. <laughs> 
uh, you know, if someone would notice that I'd shaved my legs and I was, I was aghast. Oh, lost my uh, <laughs> coming out of the public school system, going to <laughs> university and not understanding that people were a lot more relaxed in an arts degree. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people weren't going to, you know, they would be a lot more accepting. It took me a lot of time to calm down from the spaces that I'd left in school. Um, it took me a long time to trust people to be vulnerable to them. It took me a long time to feel safe enough to be myself um, because of that. And I feel like content, and especially with TikTok and, and online content, um, making that visibility and showing people and you know, getting to celebrate queerness and getting to celebrate the community as a whole now through social media and having that voice, I feel like it really does a lot for a lot of people, and I really wish, you know, I mean, I really wish that was around <laughs> more so. I and, I agree. Like and it's almost kind of like feeling sort of a child almost, like mm -hmm. becoming the outlet that you wish that you had. I mean, as a creator myself, I always say that like my main goal as a creator is to be the, like, the creator that I wanted when I was younger. Yes. And I think that we're all like pursuing that dream. Yeah. Um, before um, this panel, I actually messaged Scott to ask for his pronouns and for his sexuality. And Scott told me he is a he him and that he is asexual. And I think asexuality is something that isn't spoken about that often. And I think people can get a bit confused. So I wanted to know, Scott, if um, asexual, asexuality to dummies, let's say. Explain it to us. What's it like to be an asexual person? So, by definition, for those who don't know, it's uh, when you experience little to no sexual attraction. And, uh, yeah, it, it really isn't something that's that spoken about very much. It's kind of like on the end of LGBTQIA. But um, that's partially why it took me a while to actually come out myself. I only kind of um, came around to deciding I did fit into that category maybe about two years ago, perhaps. And it was only last year. It was only last year I actually officially, basically, mentioned it in public. I didn't really make a big sort of coming out thing, I just kind of wanted to sort of throw it out there and actually I got some very really positive feedback on that. It's like, I had like no one that I knew who was asexual at all that I could speak to about that. But then once I mentioned it, I had about six people in my inbox um, like messaging me about that. So it's been quite a strange experience, but um, yeah, that was most of like, most of uh, like my earliest moments has been a bit well, not knowing much about asexuality as, as it is, I just thought I was kind of one of those who felt like I was sort of broken. Like it's in my yeah, especially like in your teen years when you're surrounded by well, horny teenagers who are always on about that, and you feel like you've got to kind of like fit in, yeah. otherwise you get called your names and stuff. But um, no, uh, yeah, so it took quite some time. And I'm, I'm 29 now as it is, and I only came out last year, so. Well, well done, congratulations for coming out, um, and thank you for telling us a bit more about asexuality. Talking of coming out, um, I always say, I always get asked by the younger queer community, how do I come out to my parents, how do I come out to my friends and family? Um, one thing that I always say to the younger queer community is, um, well, straight people don't have to come out, so why should you? I don't think you need to pressure yourself, I don't think you need to put any sort of pressure, it's your journey. You can go about it how you will, really. Um, but Robin, how was it for you coming out? So, I was very strategic okay. <laughs> with my coming out. You've got to um, be sometimes. <laughs> start, you know, beginning with, um, with the first question of like outlets. Yeah. So I actually used cosplay and social media as a means to express myself and to and to, and to be able to have almost like an excuse yeah. when it came to answering questions to friends and family. Um, it would start off like, Mom, don't worry, it's just a TikTok trend. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about it, it's just a cosplay. So three slate from there. You know, and then three years later, Mom, I don't think it's a cosplay anymore. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, so people were very used to seeing me um, presenting as, uh, as female for about three years before I'd come out. So okay. it came to no surprise yeah. to pretty much anyone, yeah. aside from family, it was still a bit of a shock for them, mm. um, mainly so, but when, when you spend a, a long enough time saying, no, no, I smile, I've got yeah. and they go, no, actually, okay, I was lying. Um, but for the most part, when I when I came out myself, uh, the answer from a lot of people was, well, it took you long enough. 
<laughs> I think that's the, the case in most people's stories. Like, well, we knew, well done, yeah. Like, and like, oh, well, like, well, I came up with a big song and dance shots. about it. But yeah, I, I had a few people like that as well. Like, one side did. I had a few people who were like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for telling us so much. We, we, we knew, we knew. I think that's also what it's like coming out, as I always describe it like bungee jumping. So, like, Stay with me on this one, okay? So we're on the edge of an, on the edge. We're about to jump off, okay? You don't want to jump off because you think you're going to fall on the floor, splat and die, right? But then you finally do actually jump off and you realise you're attached to this bungee, to the bungee line and it's actually so much fun. You're enjoying it again after that and you want to do it again and again and again. Um, and that's how I kind of describe some people. In most, some cases, it's not like that, obviously. Um, and that's where I'm going to move on to um, LGBT plus advocacy and how we use our content um, creation for it. Charlie, me and you are very good friends, so we do make content yes. together and I know that you are very vocal on your socials about um, LGBTQ rights and also you do that by expressing your own experiences. Like, what has been a standout moment for you in your content creation where you've got like, a big um, a big reaction or a really nice conversation spark? Um, from one of your posts? Uh, I would say um, when I, like, I am a gay man, but I'm quite I'm gender, the gender you're for yeah, it, I think yeah. is the word. So I think um, a lot of my content sparks a lot of conversation about, like, what what is he? What is that? Um, and, you know, even though like, there's some negative things that come with that, I think the conversations that take place under it, like, I think that in itself, just, just being authentically myself, you know, online i think i think that in itself is is the biggest advocate that you could be like 100%. and i think we like everyone plays a part in it like everyone you know who's openly gay by whatever you are online like you play a part um but yeah i mean and i can also talk about my bad experiences and i think that's also really healthy like um when i was younger i didn't feel like i could talk to anyone about the things that happened to me like not even my family but they knew that i was gay because it was embarrassing like i felt so much shame but i think that was a a reflection of how I felt about myself. I don't think I was actually as confident as I thought I was. Um, I think, but now I'm so like myself, like I'm so comfortable with yeah. who I am that when these things happen to me, I'm aware that there is nothing wrong with me. The problem is with the people that you know go out of their way to be hateful. So by sharing those experiences, like you spark those conversations, and even if it's just one DM, if like if I talk about something that happened to me that's embarrassing, like was embarrassing. Um, or you know hateful like and I get one DM from someone coming to me saying to me oh actually I've had this and this happened to me and this really helped me like you're doing God's work yeah 100% and I think you also made a good point a minute ago what are you talking about God on my LGBTQ <laughs> <laughs> um, like, 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 something that's really important as well is that you just touched on whether you're you know lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, gay um, just by being on the app and making all content, the same fight. It, it, even by that, just making it um, as visible, I think, is enough. Do you know what I mean? A hundred percent. I find that a lot of times it comes down to education. Yeah. And with activism, I find education is something that I'm aspiring to to take on. Uh, and I, I want to become as educated as possible to help make things understandable when it comes to like gender and gender identity 100%. the conversations get very it gets very philosophical yes the conversations well how do you define gender and what what how do we decide these things and i'm in the process at the moment of trying to come up with an analogy almost or even a book um that would help describe these types of things through art theory I and like trying to idea. understand gender in the way of art theory there, there are ways that like the two things correlate very heavily without having to invalidate anyone else's experience as an artist or as a purveyor of gender. Idea. <laughs> you have your traditionalists, the binary genders, you have your abstract artists, non-binary. Mm -hmm. Once you start playing art theory, you find it gets really understandable. I really love that thought process about <laughs> it actually. Um, and I find that education really is like the, the crux of when it comes to like patron too. It's very difficult to find patience yes. for people who are spiteful and hateful and will actively go out of their way to try and harm you. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to have the patience. But what gives me that patience is understanding that this does come from a place of, of, misedu of miseducation, yeah. that, that they are also themselves a victim yes. of, of, 
of you know the the systems that be uh, and, 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 the, and their like lifestyles and, and, and their you know positions in life, they aren't in a position to be educated. So you know. It's almost in a way like they don't really know the damage they're doing, they don't realise. Yeah, I think it's a really healthy way to look at it as well because you can take it quite personally sometimes mm -hmm. when people don't understand. And also when they are, you know, quite hateful. Oh, it's going in very hard. Um, and I think that's something that you, um, I think the way you just described it there, I think it's really amazing, that like, healthy way to think about it. Especially as queer people online, we will experience hate. And Scott, I saw a video that you were applied to a comment the other day, um, of a, no, it was a DM that someone sent you, um, someone telling you to repent. And you have a really cool analogy about Hinduism as well. And um, would you like to tell them what, what it was that was like the, the story did? So I really liked it and I really, really put it into a point. So it was in shorthand essentially, but uh, I, so I get a bunch of uh, really, really conservative Christians in my inbox often say things like, oh, you need to repent. And uh, so I had one base in my inbox who said that, and I, I just responded uh, with, um, I'm not a Christian, why, oh no, sorry, no, so it was, it was blasphemy, they were saying, you know what you do is blasphemy, right? And I said, well, I'm not a Christian, why would I go about blasphemy? And he said, it's still blasphemy, you need to repent, you need to go to church right now and uh, repent for the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you. And I just said to him, you know, have you ever eaten beef? And he was confused at first, eventually he said yes. And I said, well, you know, it, it, that, that's considered wrong in some place. In, in Hinduism, cows are considered sacred. They've been with us for so long, the humankind, they're loved like family to some people. So, you know, in some places around the world, it's illegal to consume beef. Therefore, you need to stop their eating beef and live like them. And they, they basically said, like, well, well, I'm not a Hindu. Why does that matter to me? I said, well, exactly. So I'll ask again, why, do I, why should I care about blasphemy? when I'm not a Christian. Yeah, I think it was a really, really clever way of putting it, and it really kind of like spun exactly what they were doing on you, background on them, and I think that's like kind of like an educational way, like you were saying in a way, it's kind of educating them in a way, because it's making them think about their thought process. Um, in terms of the social media space at the minute with the LGBTQ+, and this is an open question for anyone to answer, um, what do you think um, needs to be changed with the representation on LGBTQ+, not by creators, but um, by by the app itself, by social media culture itself, if you get what I'm trying to ask. I don't think there's enough, um, I don't think there's enough, like, when it comes to the restrictions, like, especially on apps like TikTok, yeah. they're so harsh on what you can and can't do. Yeah, I agree. But when it comes to homophobia or any, kind, you know, any of the phobias and racism even, yeah. like, like even bigger topic, like there's not enough um, protection. Like unless you go out of your way to report it, and that like, they've got like you know the key words there, the, the words they shouldn't be using. But you can go around the houses and imply something um, and be offensive still and get away with it. But then if you retaliate or you make a video back or a comment back and you oh, yeah. you go to you know even if it's like oh, a bit God, of education yeah. back to them and you get penalised. Yeah, you don't even have to be offensive. Like you could be you could be like. You know, well mannered about it, and still you get you get you know banned. You get the the strike. Um, that happened to me. Do you remember the first couple of years on TikTok? I was like, I used to make videos back. I've learned to not do that. It's just stop giving them attention. <laughs> yeah, you blew up. I went for a phase of just you like, blew up. Keep actually on replying. You blew up on TikTok replying to. Yeah, I did for a while. For a hate comment. Yeah, but that's it, it ended badly. <laughs> I, I just get all the trolls. I said, I just gained all the trolls by doing that. <laughs> I, I was going to ask that. Like, the, the amount of times I've had people in my comments with like swastikas in their names and what? profile pictures, and I really? call them an idiot, and I'm the one who gets like the content, like the, the strike warning. Is it like, why? You've got actual like hate speech in my comments right there, and you do <laughs> absolutely nothing against it. What? And then you peel it, and they're like, we've looked at it, and we cannot restore your content. And it's like, really? double whammy. So I think it's obviously really important for us all to have our own community and Robin also being part of the trans community, you're also a part of the crossplay community and I just wanted to know how social media has amplified your voice or helped you forge community connections. Um, so when it comes to the cosplay community, a lot of transgender people find a lot of um, sanctuary in yeah. the cosplay community. It's, it's a, a hobby where you get to be 
who you want to be, you get to express yourself in whatever gender, whatever form you wish. So there is a very large transgender community within the cosplay community, naturally so. Um, I've been playing a lot of VR recently too. Oh, have you? And I'll, I haven't got into VR For yet. the same reasons, there's a huge trans community on there as well. Exactly. It's, it's a place obviously where you can, where you can be and express yourself yeah. without limitations. Express, get the press. <laughs> Love it, I just made that up right there. <laughs> um, and yeah, much like cosplay helped me, it gave me a space to explore. I I know, uh, so I had some some like Discord servers and I have community spaces now um, where I get to house I get to house my babies basically. And basically yeah, and they all get to come together and you know, everyone gets to share advice and information and things. So I feel like it all comes back again to like education and to, like, people coming together, sharing what they know. Um, when it comes to transitioning, especially in the UK and everything, there's a lot of information that, that isn't it's not centralised, you know. Yeah. You know, it's crazy to think that transitioning isn't something that's particularly easy to actually get like a lot of help and information on. Um, you know, it's not a centralized thing. There isn't like a pamphlet that goes, well, here's yeah. what everything needs to go. And, yeah. you know, um, having access to the community is, I think, very important. They lean on each other. Yes, everybody helps each other. Everyone goes, well, hey, okay, well, this helped me. Everyone has a lot of anecdotal yeah. experiences. You say, okay, well, don't bother wasting your time with this clinic, baby. Uh, like, you know, go to this one instead, actually, because that one's got a bigger wait time. So much helpful information can save you a lot of time by being around the community. So for me, something that's very important is, is being able to house those communities and helping people come together so that they can also, we can all just help each other. I think the trans community especially needs to stay tight knit. Like, you've got us all under a minute, but as like you said, back in 2016, it was under a lot of scrutiny. Things have got better, but it could be a lot better. I think that trans people have got a big, big fight still to do, uh, like a lot more than what um, you know, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people have to do. You know, you've got half all back behind us because they've recently. What is it that they've recently stopped doing? They've recently PBT blockers. They've stopped yes. giving PBT blockers now, which yes. I know how actually life changing those PBT blockers can be. Because we've got trans friends, haven't we, who uh, started their PBT blockers from like 11. To like 13, a couple of years ago now, but um, and it helps them present it even more feminine when they get old, when they get older, don't they? Yes. Like they do when, when it comes to uh, to the future blockers, it's it's a that was you know when it comes to so much conversation about the politics, because when it comes to LGBTQ plus, there's a lot that is difficult to define in simple terms, and politics likes simple, easy to define things. And it gets very messy once you have to try and uncover everything at once and do everything at once. Um, I, I watched a video recently where so when it comes to like politics, it's not there's not one cure fix all kind of thing. It's always small victories and small movements and small yeah. push, pushings of the needle. Um, and yeah, we're we're in a time when we've got election. I mean, it's always when America has an election coming up that the big talk or the big gay talk comes about and the big trans agenda oh, talk comes it about. It boils my blood, you know, honestly. It's, it's been four years, we're, we're, uh, back, on, we're back on the chopping block again. Um, you know, it's a wedge topic that gets used a lot and, yeah, and it, honestly, every four years now it's becoming quite a trend. And it's almost like trans people are now becoming a bit of a scapegoat for the government as well. Yeah, we go to a lot of the trans protests and things like that, but I think the one thing that one most people can do to really try and change the situation is register to vote yes. and get the government out so that they can stop um, using the trans community as a scapegoat and let them live their most authentic lives. We haven't got long left, we've got about five minutes left, so I wanted to ask a bit, um, an important question to all of you, um, one by one, I want you all of your answers. So Scott, um, what is the best um, advice you could give to an ally, an ally right now in your audience? I think um, I think we already touched on this earlier with the education. I think that is the most important thing, so it should be the most helpful here. Because uh, if I'm honest, um, in my early twenties, I actually considered myself a bit more of a centrist, and I kind of fell for that trap of following more right-wing media that misrepresents it essentially. And I, I, for, for like most of my colleagues there, I didn't understand a lot of LGBT, and it wasn't until I actually started actually talking to the right communities actually engaging with the right people that I started to learn what it was actually about, not what shock media is trying to do. So, 
education really is the best way to actually get people to actually understand it more in as simplistic as you can get because the the um, the opponents you're going to get as you see they are not going to be the clients actually really not to be honest they're, they're really not you've got to just keep it basic and if you can like actually get their attention to maybe allow them to do their own research in their own private time i think that's far better than just just constantly going from back and forth because those people you are never going to get some common ground with them you need to keep it basic and in a way that it actually allows them to show curiosity in what you're yeah. actually trying to put across. I agree. Charlie? Um, have a voice for the people that don't have voices. Like, there, I've had situations out in public. Like, for me, it's like things like that. Like, like literal situations where me and my boyfriend, we've been out and about and, you know, people make comments or men want to be the big laddie. Oh, yeah, they make a comment or they're laughing at you. And then there's like the group around them, the friends, and they all just stand by us, yeah. And it's like you—you you may have gay friends, you may—you may think you're doing enough, but like it's those moments where you can make a difference. Say something. Say something. You don't—you you don't even have to do it there and then. But make, like say something. Like don't allow the people around you to behave that way or associate with people like that, and call yourself an ally because that's not an ally. I agree. Um, yeah. I agree. Thank you, Robin. I think um, when it comes to being a part of the LGBTQ, it, 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 is, it can get tiring to be in a position of always needing patience and to be educated. And to be like the gay Wikipedia all the exactly. time. Exactly. You know what I mean? Um, and it, it is. <laughs> you know, I always have to answer questions. It's just like, it's actually a simple concept. Yes. Uh, we live in a time where debate culture is very prevalent and instead of conversations, we have debates. And we all want to win in an argument, yeah. we want to win a debate and and we, we've kind of built that, like social media has kind of perpetuated this more so I and I feel like in spaces where people say inappropriate things, if you catch anyone say it, like saying something that you don't feel is appropriate, instead of perhaps going at it with aggression and saying, you shouldn't say that, that's all, that's terrible, a lot of times people aren't emotionally equipped to accept what you're telling them once you once you, once you attack them in that way, it's too aggressive. Everyone's very emotionally vulnerable. Going in guns blazing, a lot of times we'll just close the door. It yeah. takes a lot of patience to, to just quickly breathe and say, okay, why did you say that? Why did you think that? Why did you, okay, ta explain the joke. Yeah. Explain why you said what you just said and let them do the, the unraveling the themselves. I mean, as going, oh wait. Why do I think this? Yeah. Why did I just say this really horrible thing? I don't actually believe what I'm saying. This is a borrowed opinion. Yeah. This was something that I inherited. Yeah. Um, and I've had the, those kind of conversations with people quite a lot where they've said things to me and I go, okay, well, why did you say that? And they, and they very slowly unravel and, and they quickly realize that what they've just perpetuated was something inherited and not something they necessarily believed in. And it's, it takes a bit of patience to be able to do it, it um, but I feel like as allies to uh, feel like if you're in a workplace, if you're in a family space, taking that time, it helps the community a great deal. I definitely agree. Well, guys, you have been absolutely amazing. Can we give them all a round of applause, please? You've been so good. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you.